Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, and one other announcement she didn't mention, and I didn't tell her this, but uh, we are not going to be having icons. So our high school, middle school ministry is uh, going to be off uh, today. We will not have icon. And then also uh, next Sunday, we will not have icon. So I think it's January 2nd, I believe, is next Sunday. So we won't have icon today or January 2nd. January 9th when we come, or I, when school is starting up again, uh, we'll go ahead and get our ICON going. Uh, so that should be cool. We have some pretty big announcements for ICON, um, but we will wait uh, to make those announcements. But just be excited. Know that ICON is, is moving along pretty strong. <clears throat> um, let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and study your word, and worship you, and get to know you as who you are in the scriptures. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you that the scriptures uh, speak to us. Lord, they, they speak to us and, and hopefully uh, change our hearts and, and incline our hearts uh, towards you, Lord. Uh, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for a reliable document uh, that we can have um, a reliable, a reliable truth in your scripture, in your word, that we can have for us, Lord. It's a, it's a blessing, Lord. I pray that as we study scripture, our lives, uh, it just doesn't become, it's just not head knowledge for us, Lord, but, but I pray that, that, the, that the scripture just moves our hearts and changes our hearts, and, and we go from a people who, who don't know you, don't love you, Lord, uh, I pray that we go from that to a people who love you and worship you and want to tell other people, the whole world, about you, Lord. Uh, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> First of all, I just want to say Merry Christmas. Uh, I wasn't going to start with Merry Christmas, but since it was yesterday, I figured I would say Merry Christmas to you guys. Hopefully, you got the things that you wanted. Hopefully, the gifts that you put so much effort into giving Hopefully they were well received and the people you gave them to uh, <clears throat> love their gifts. Just a personal, I, I know a few weeks ago when I was preaching, I said uh, my kids wanted the Nintendo Switch. We got that for them. And so, yeah, no, don't cheer, guys. It's not good. Um, no, it's, it's nice. So we played Mario Kart yesterday. Mario Kart was, uh, what, is my wife in here? No, she, she beat me. <laughs> She beat me every time. She's like, I beat you four times in a row. I was first, you were second. <clears throat> um, so welcome. Uh, I want to start today. I want to talk about the movie, The Lion King. Now, this is an older movie, but it's a classic. Um, it's such a good story. It's such a compelling story. I want to, I want to start with that story. <clears throat> if you haven't seen it, come over to our house later. There's toys everywhere, but we can find a space for you. We can watch it uh, together. But essentially, if you have not seen The Lion King, right? The Lion King is a story uh, about a young prince whose father died, right? The young prince, the Simba, whose father died. And so he was supposed to become king, uh, but, but he ended up running from that, right? He, he did not become who he was called to be, or he was having a hard time becoming who he was called to be. Right? And there comes a part in the story uh, when he is, you know, he's called to be a king, right? His father died, so he's next in command. But instead of taking on that position, he's like ran away from home, right? And so he, he, he leaves home, he leaves his, his, his kingdom, what's, what's his, and he's super responsible. He is hanging out with these two funny characters, um, <clears throat> and he is not doing what, 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 the, what, what, uh, what he was supposed to be doing. And, and, and in the middle of this slumber, in the middle of this neglect of his call, he has this vision, right? His, his dad appears to him from the clouds, and in this very mighty voice, he says, remember who you are. And he's like, I don't want to, I can't, I can't do it. And his dad, remember who you are. 
And he continues to fight with, his, with this vision that he's having of his dad communicating to him. And his dad continuously says over and over and over again, remember who you are. You see, Simba, he was a king, but he wasn't acting like it. And, and those around him, those around him were not experiencing uh, we're not experiencing who he was supposed to be. Or he was supposed to be king, and the people around him were not experiencing him. And if you remember from the movie, more clearly, the, 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 the kingdom that he left, it went to ruins, it went to uh, destruction because the life that Simba was living. <clears throat> now, I think us as Christians, we struggle in the same sort of way. We forget who we are in Christ, right? Our actions, the things that we do, don't necessarily line up with who we are, right? The way we act, practically speaking, is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily line up with who we are, positionally speaking, Right? Practically, the things that I do uh, versus positionally, I am a child of God. Right, I am in God's kingdom. So this is my position, but practically, that's not being uh, lived out. And it's, it's, it's around this time of year, right? Around the holidays, right? We just finished Christmas. Next time uh, we see each other, it'll be... New Year's, and it's around this time of year that, that we start to notice these areas where we might be missing the mark. All right, that's, what, that's what New Year's resolutions are all about, right? What did I do bad last year? Oh, how did I drop the ball last year? How can I do better this upcoming year? We try to, we try to correct the mistakes uh, that we have made, we, we, we look around, we, 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 we take some sort of, of self-assessment, <clears throat> and we think, man, I'm nowhere near where I had planned to be, I'm nowhere near where I wanted to be, and so we start to make uh, these New Year's resolutions, and that's oftentimes how our New Year's resolutions are formed. Now, I'd venture to say all of us in here, if, if we were to think back on this past year, every one of us would have some sort of story to tell, some instance in their life where, where they recognize that they missed a mark, that they fell short in some area. Now, for our purposes this morning, I want us to focus on that. What areas did we fall short on last year? But I want to focus on those things in terms of our interpersonal relationships, right? In, in terms of my relationship with uh, my wife or, or your spouse or you, your, excuse me, your, uh, your, your children or your coworkers or those closest to you. Right? How have you missed the mark, not so much in your career or personal, um, personal progress, but how have you missed the mark in your personal relationships? <clears throat> so today my goal, today I hope for, what I, what I want us to leave here with is a framework. Right? I want us to leave here with a model that will help us process these thoughts Help us think through these sorts of things as we approach the new year. So we're going to get a model of, I guess you could say, it's really like a goal setting type thing. But we could use it for uh, our New Year's resolutions. And then I want to give us one specific thing that we should focus on as we make these New Year's resolutions. <clears throat> um, I trust, I, 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 I anticipate all of us are going to be thinking about these sorts of big life questions in the next couple of days, um, the next upcoming week. And so as we are thinking through these thoughts, I just want to give us some tools to be able to think through them 
a little more clearly. <clears throat> now, what I don't want us to think, or, or what I don't want you guys to think right now, is I, is I don't want you to think that this sermon is just a, a self-improvement, a, a get-better sermon. Uh, I don't want you to think that this is just a, what is it, a, 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 a self-help type sermon that is not the case. Um, the situation uh, that we're going to be talking about, this model that I'm going to be giving you guys, is a model that we find in Scripture. And we're going to pull from that story today. And <clears throat> it's interesting because the Israelites were in a very similar situation. All right, except they weren't, the Israelites in the story we're going to talk about today, they weren't trying to get better, they weren't trying to improve their lives. They were happy and, and, and being blissfully ignorant and doing the evil things that they wanted to do. So it wasn't the Israelites that wanted to get better, but it was one of the prophets. And that's one of the, the stories, the story we're going to look at today. It's, it's the prophets. The prophets were looking at the Israelites and, and warning them, telling them, hey guys, we need to get it right. We need to do better. So in today's passage, we're going to we're going to be in the final verses from the prophet Malachi. I always say Malichi, but it's not. It's not funny. It's funny. I, so I took a Old Testament class, and the professor has PhDs. He says that it's uh, Malichi, and he's the Italian disciple who wrote, the, the Italian prophet who wrote the Old Testament. Anyway. Um, a lot of people say Malichi, though. But anyway, it's Malachi. <clears throat> it is in the final, uh, the final chapter, the final verses of Malachi. Now, Malachi is the last book in our Old Testament. It is the last book. So at the, if you look through your Bible, the last 12 books of the Old Testament are known as the, the minor prophets, right? The last 12 are known as the minor prophets. And Malachi is at the end of the minor prophets. He's the last prophet to write, and Malachi is also the last book in our Old Testament. Now, to understand the prophetical books, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of what, what you can expect from these prophetical books, right? And so, uh, the Bible is roughly, again, this is, the Bible is roughly broken down, organized in specific ways. You have the first five books that really deal with the history, the law, really deal with the beginnings of the Israelites. They deal with how to uh, be holy, how to live within the land, right? That's when God calls them to become a people, and, and he gives them the laws and all of those sorts of things, right? And so the prophets, at the end of the Bible, right, they are not adding to that story, but they're basically doing like an evaluation of the Israelites. Like, hey, this isn't right, this is wrong, you need to do this better, right? So they're speaking into the culture, trying to call the people back to the ways of God. So that's generally what the prophets are doing. Right? They are assessing how the Israelites are doing as God's people. Right? Are they keeping the law? Are they acting like they're God's chosen people? Right? And in Malachi, we see that they are missing the mark. Right? <clears throat> Just to name a couple of examples that we see, uh, a couple of issues that Malachi talks about. Um, he talks about, one of the things he talks about is uh, exposing corruption. Um, he encourages them, well, he, he encouraged them uh, saying that God still loves them, right? He is calling the Israelites out for defiling the temple. They're bringing their, uh, so they're supposed to bring their best sacrifices uh, to the temple to be sacrificed, but they're bringing the ugliest uh, sacrifices to the temple, the, the ones with blemishes, the spotty ones, the scrawny ones, the ones that people don't want. They're saying, hey, let's go take these to the Lord. Right? They're, they're, they're not bringing their best. Right? The, the priests are also participating in corrupt forms of worship. 
The men of the culture are idolaters. They are uh, divorcing their wives for no other reason than the fact that they, they like the foreign wives or the foreign ladies and they start to divorce their wives and start to marry foreign women. And as a result, I mean, you see this throughout all of Scripture, but whenever that starts to happen, <clears throat> the, the men start to then worship the gods of the, the foreign woman, right? And so even if you're not familiar, even if you, you're not familiar with, with God's uh, the, the, the law or the story, uh, you, can, you can tell just by listening to this list that the Israelites are missing the mark. They were not living, they were not doing the things that they were called to be doing. <clears throat> they were in a prime position to ask the question, how am I doing? How, how would I like to change? What should we do to not have this happen again? However, that thought was not on their minds Fortunately, fortunately, it was on Malachi's mind. And he calls them to, or as he calls them to correct their ways, <clears throat> he concludes his book. Remember, this is the last book in the Old Testament. He concludes his book like this. It's in, it's in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. It says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I com commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. Now, Horeb is basically uh, where Mount Sinai was. Uh, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So I said I was going to give us a framework here, and I want to, the first, the first part of this frame, the first thing that I want us to see from this passage is, is the way that he starts this passage, right? He says, remember the law of my servant Moses, All right? So, so our first part is remember where you came from. The first thing that Malachi does or as he's concluding this book, he says, remember where you came from. Look back, recall, see where you came from. That is what he is encouraging the Israelites to do. Remember, look back. He wants them to remember their, uh, where they came from, or as Mufasa would say, remember who you are. There are countless passages to look back on in the Old Testament, right? So there are many things that the, the Israelites could do, many stories that they could look back to to remember who they are. Here, here are some that come to mind, and these will not be projected, but here are some that come to mind. They could remember uh, the words of, uh, of, of Moses in Exodus 6, 7. This is, uh, uh, this is the Lord speaking. He says, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Remember who you are. Remember what I have done for you. Leviticus 19 says, and the Lord God spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord God, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal, I am the Lord your God. Remember who you are. You are my chosen people. You are my children. He's calling them, Malachi is calling the Israelites to remember the relationship that God made with them. 
They were, they were not a people. They were made a, a unified people. God entered into a covenant relationship with them. You see this in Genesis uh, chapter 15. I mean, you see this all the way to Genesis 2. But you see this in Genesis chapter 15 where, where God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. <clears throat> you see this throughout all of the Old Testament. All right, remember this. Remember that he has established them. So he established them to this great nation during the time of King Solomon. Right? God had done great things and he will continue to do so. Remember where you came from. Now the New Testament says it this way. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, this is Paul writing, and he says, Remember that you were, at that time, separated from Christ, alien, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Right? Christians, we are a part of this story. Remember the life that Christ called us from. Remember, what Christ has called you from. <clears throat> Some of us we may have, we may have crazy testimonies. We may, you know, have been, you know, drug addict, just in jail, the whole deal, no regard for the Lord. Right? We could have crazy testimonies. We could have very seemingly innocent testimonies. Maybe, maybe the, the craziest thing that you did was steal cookies from the, candy, uh, the cookie jar when you were five years old. But remember the life that Christ called you from. Regardless of, of, of where you were, what you were doing, what Christ called you from, remember that you were standing in opposition to God. You were not on, you were his enemy. You were not on the same team. We all were. I was. Every single one of us in this room was at one point in opposition to God. And, and, and remember that he called us, Christian, he called us from that life. He called us from death to life. He called us <clears throat> from a life of separation from him to a life covered by the blood of his son. He, God, has brought us near. As we look back, I want us to remember that also. Now, question you might have right now is as you think back in your life as you look back at, uh, over the course of your life a question that you might have is why why should I remember and what I want to say is as we remember it helps us move forward it helps us push along I've been a I have a treadmill Treadmill's a beast, okay? People ask me, Billy, does the treadmill work? I've seen you for about two years since you've had it, and you look the same, man. The treadmill does. <laughs> and I just want to say my treadmill's awesome. I'm the one that doesn't work, okay? Um, <clears throat> um, but the treadmill is great. It, it really is. It's one of those treadmills where it has, like, the screen, and it has trainers, and, and they have, like, workouts planned for you and whole workout programs and series, and... You basically just get on the treadmill, push play, and then you try and keep up with what they're doing. And so it's super cool. <clears throat> uh, and so yesterday I was running. I was doing a workout series. 
And uh, I was in the middle, and, and the, the series is starting to get a little bit more difficult. It's starting to build on, um, yeah, just, 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 just build up and, 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 and make it more and more difficult. And so it's in those difficult times you're just like, oh, let me just adjust the speed, or let me just slow down, or maybe let me skip today, or I'll just stop here. And as I was thinking about that, as I was, I was <clears throat> wanting to, uh, or actually as I was considering that, one of the things that the trainer said, he's like, all right, guys, I want you to do right now, I want you to do is, I want you to remember your why. I want you to remember why you started this program. This is starting to get difficult. I want you to remember your why. Look at your post-it. See whatever uh, you wrote on that post-it. What is your reason for being on this machine today? What's your reason for working out today? He says, remember that. Remember that. Remember your why. Remember what brought you here. Keep pushing forward, right? So, so why do we look back? Because as we look back as, as in our lives, in, in, in light of the gospel, as we look back to where Christ has called us from, it can help us to clearly look forward and move forward. <clears throat> now, part of the problem with this, though, is as, 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 as we look back and as we see where we came from, we look ahead and we start to get overwhelmed with all of the different things that could potentially be there. We, again, we look back, we are sure of who we are in Christ, but looking forward can be overwhelming. Which leads us to our second framework piece, our second piece of the model. So the first one was remember uh, where you came from. The second one is remember where you are going. In Malachi verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 5, uh, he says, <clears throat> in our passage we just read, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So here, right, Malachi just says in verse 4, look back. And in verse 5, he says, okay, this is what's happening in the future. And what is he pointing to? What is the great and awesome day of the Lord? <clears throat> now, typically, when we hear this phrase in Scripture, the, the, the great and awesome day of the Lord, it's referring to uh, the Lord and how he was about to bring judgment <laughs> on the Israelites for um, their disobedience. Right, for, for them being unfaithful. And so what I want to make clear for us, what I, what I want us to hear is, is as we look back, we can, we can identify that we are secure in Christ. So then as we look forward, we don't look forward with this sense of fear and, and um, nervousness and um, reservation, but we look forward in excitement. Right? The Lord is going, uh, the Lord is returning. We are not his enemy anymore. We are his child. <clears throat> as as, as, as this, 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 this coming day of the Lord approaches, we are uh, we are viewed as his friend, the Lord's friend, and not his enemy. All right? Jesus, the work of Jesus on the cross, makes us right. Now, now this is though, this is where I want to move from this positional uh, status, right? Our position before the Lord and the way we live practically in light of that in, in, in relation to to that position, right? Are we living practically? Are we living in a way that matches who we are positionally? Am I practically living out the person I am in Christ? And if we can just go back to the, um, the Mufasa story and Simba story. This was a person who was a king, and he was a, a lion king, the lion king. <laughs> well, wow. Um, 
he was the lion king, right? And he was, um, uh, you know, lions are supposed to be the king, supposed to be the boss, eating the meat, right? Controlling uh, their kingdom. And, and what was Simba doing? He was rolling around eating bugs, right? And he was, he was eating worms, eating bugs. He was not, he was not acting he wasn't living practically to who he was positionally. Now again, as we think through this and, and as we look, assess our lives and, and we start to think about the ways that, that Christ calls us to and the ways that we have fallen short and all of us here have, <clears throat> what I want us to be encouraged by or what I want us to be focusing in on is I want our focus to be relationally. What are some areas in your life that you know you aren't measuring up to who Christ has called you to be relationally? <clears throat> so, so, so knowing where we came from and where we are going helps us to accurately uh, see today. Again, as I said, this step can be overwhelming. And, and, and as we think about how we're going to focus in relationally, I think it's super fascinating from this passage uh, what Malachi says. He says, and he, he's talking about Elijah, when, when the, the, the second day of the second, um, or the, 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 when Elijah is coming and, and um, the awesome day of the Lord, he says this. He says, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. So the, the third part, the, the third piece to this framework is uh, I want us to remember those closest to us. Remember those closest to us, right? Oftentimes, those closest to us receive the worst from us. They get the leftovers of our lives. They're the ones who feel the brunt of our poor decisions, right? They're the ones who are the uh, recipients of our impatience. They are the recipients of our frustration, I am supposed to be teaching uh, my kids, my children about patience. Uh, when we were standing up here uh, praying before the service, uh, Lisa had asked me, she's like, hey, how are you, how you doing? And I'm like, it's crazy right now, uh, you know, with all three little boys. And, and, and the temptation is to be impatient, and I am supposed to be patient with them when oftentimes I'm not. Yesterday was Christmas, and my mom, she started... Um, she started, uh, Chris, so we had like way more Christmas presents than we should have, like anybody should have. And me and Lisa were looking at our presents and the ones that we bought and the ones that her parents bought. And like, it's not that many. And, but my mom, she started shopping for Christmas presents back in October. And my mom is like, hey, I like this random thing for Matthew. And so she'll buy it and then she'll go to the store next week. And, and so <clears throat> they bought all these presents, and, and I was the one, hey, Daddy, can you help me build this? Hey, Daddy, can you help me build that? And I was growing impatient. I'm supposed to be kind and loving to my wife when, 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 or, and, and considerate of my wife when oftentimes I make decisions, and I just hope that she, uh, she is okay with those decisions. Where do you fall short relationally? I've heard too many stories of people turning from God because they knew a Christian who was, who was a lot less Christ-like than they should have been. Right, I've heard of too many stories where kids grew up in Christian homes and they saw anything but the gospel lived out. I want to encourage us this morning to change that trend. Let, 
Let those closest to us experience Christ living in us. And again, I think it's so interesting that Malachi points out uh, this family relationship of all the things that he could have talked about. He could have talked about, coached the Israelites on how to be better leaders. He could have coached the Israelites, talked to the Israelites about being faithful, about um, <clears throat> tithing uh, correctly, about bringing the proper sacrifices to the temple. But he chooses a family relationship. He talks about, he talks about fathers and sons being restored to one another. Why does he choose to talk about this? Well, for one, I think the family is super important in Scripture. It's a primary way. I believe it's a primary way that, that God's kingdom is expanded, spreads, is through the family. I'm just going to give us a brief survey here. In Genesis chapter 2, we see uh, <clears throat> God create Adam and Eve, and he says to be fruitful and multiply, right? Fill the, the land that I have given you. And, 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 and so how is, that, um, how is that related to this family unit? Well, I think it's really interesting in, in, Noah, in, Noah, in Genesis chapter 6 with Noah, how, how, how God is, looks down at earth and he says, everybody there is wicked. I'm going to destroy the whole earth. But he saves Noah and his wife. Now, if it was going to be just get rid of everybody, he didn't care about the family, then it would have just been Noah and his wife. But who, who is alive? It's Noah, his wife, and their kids and their spouses. It's this model, this image of, of, of God's kingdom growing through families. In Genesis 12, right, God makes his cover, covenant with, with uh, Abraham. And he says, I'm going to give you many descendants and I'm going to make you a great nation. Right? We see King David. Jesus was to be from the line of King David. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to project this. <clears throat> it says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land with, uh, to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, be careful to do them, that it may go well <clears throat> with you, and that you may multiply, multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, had promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. So we'll continue on, but this is when the Israelites are about to go into the promised land. And he, he's telling this. He continues in, ver, in, in verse 4. He says, Here is uh, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and all your soul, and all your might. And these words that I command you shall be on your heart. Verse 7, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you're having dinner together, and when you're at the table with one another, and, you, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. There's this emphasis. Teach your children. Teach the next generation. Right? You shall bind them as a sign on your hand that they shall be frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. There's this importance of spreading God's kingdom through the family. In Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, <clears throat> uh, Paul spends considerable amount of time talking about the family, right? He talks about husbands and wives, and he talks about the children, I could, I could go on and on. I could talk about this stuff all day. Um, but the problems arise when our hearts are turned 
from our families. Problems arise when our hearts are turned from the, those closest to us. The book of Malachi was a prime example of this. The men were turning from their families and they were divorcing their wives for no good reason other than they wanted to marry for foreign women. We talked about this earlier. It never led to anything good. I have in this book, I want to read a story. It's called Tender Warrior. It's a really good book. Um, I want to read a story of a daughter whose father's heart was turned from her and the effects that it had. <clears throat> it says, My dad was what I thought was a real man. He was the provider and worked hard for our physical needs. He had to go 150 miles away from home to find work, coming home often and only on weekends. As could be expected, I didn't know my dad very well. When I reached adolescence, I began to desire more than anything to win his approval. It became all consuming, an all-consuming need. I went back and forth from being a tomboy to being feminine to try to get him to like me. I took up fishing and made myself pull worms apart and get slime underneath my fingernails so that I could bait my own hooks and we could go fishing. But he didn't have time to go fishing anymore. I started playing softball and I became the best pitcher in our school, but he never saw me play a game. I worked hard to get straight A's and was always on the honor roll. Never once did he say he was proud of me. One year I was a cheerleader. He never came to a game. One year I was captain of the drill team. He never saw a performance. One weekend I tried to help him work on the car, but he was cross with me and I was in the way. I went into the house and made some cookies he said I baked them too long. More and more, I found myself retreating to my room on the weekends, sobbing violently, desperately wanting him to care. Not once did he comfort me. He never read to me. He never tucked me into bed. He never hugged me. He never kissed me. He never said, I love you. I got married and had four kids. The last one was a boy, the only male descendant. We gave him, the boy, my father's name. He wasn't impressed. Restless and dissatisfied with mothering, I went back to school. S uh, somehow, without meaning to, I found myself studying civil engineering, the field of study closest to his profession. I worked as a surveyor uh, last year, laying out lines <clears throat> just like the, one, the lines he had put in for years. And I found myself thinking, if he could see me now, he would be so proud of me. What a powerful what a power a father has over the direction of a daughter's life, good or bad, present or absent. He's going to have an influence that lasts a lifetime. I think of a, I think a lot of fathers leave their daughters to mothers, to the mothers to raise, thinking a man's influence isn't necessary for girls. I am 37 years old now and beginning to see how much I am still compelled by a deep craving within to gain the approval of this most significant man. You see, if my own father doesn't think I'm worthwhile, I must be worthless. If my own father can't accept me, then I must be unacceptable. If my own father cannot love me, then I must totally be unlovable. If I'm truly worthless and unacceptable and unlovable, then God couldn't really love me. And certainly my dear husband, who is only human, couldn't really love me. She finishes with this. She says, I thank God he is opening my eyes to these lies and showing me his truth. He has begun the process of healing, but the wounds are deep. <clears throat> All this daughter wanted was her father's approval. Now, I could probably go around the room and we all have some of these stories. 
But my question for us is, are we that father? Are we that person? Are you that person to your kids, to your coworkers? Are you that person to your friends? Are you that person to those closest to you? And, and I know I'm talking to fathers here, but this applies to the, to the young ones as well. Are you this way to your parents? The worst part of this story is, is, <clears throat> is just the next sentence after where I stopped. She had talked about fearing that this would pass down generation to generation to generation. And you see that happening in Scripture. But the reverse is true also. Right? Good things can be passed down. I remember, man, this was maybe about 10 years ago. I went to uh, a funeral. Now, this funeral was of uh, Pastor Randy's dad, right? His dad passed away, and <clears throat> Randy had uh, given the, 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 the uh, he, he spoke at the funeral. He conducted the whole ceremony uh, of, of the funeral, and it was something that I'm never, ever, ever going to forget. At some point during the funeral service, Randy had all of Mr. Caulfield's children, right, Randy and his siblings, come up to the stage. He had his mom up there, uh, and then all of the siblings. And the beautiful thing was these siblings had kids. And you saw this generational heritage of, of faith, of Christianity. And at the head of that was Mr. Caulfield, right? You saw the, the you saw the grandfather, and then you saw Pastor Randy and his siblings and their children, and you saw all of these generations who loved Jesus. And again, at the head of that was Randy's dad. Such a beautiful, beautiful picture, and I want that for all of us. And as we begin to close this morning, I want to focus. I want our focus to be on relationships. I want our focus to be specifically on those closest to us. Now, remember the framework? We look back, remember who we are, we remember where we are going, and then we look around and focus on those closest to us. Now, if you're thinking, well, <clears throat> what exactly should I do? How should I be engaging these people? How should I be loving on these people better? How can I be more Christ-like to them? I, I have not given us any specific steps for that, and I'm, and I'm not going to, but I do have something that can help you along this, uh, this, this, this path. I, I, I have something that can help us figure out how we should act in these close relationships, and that is to, to ask. Ask them. Ask your spouse Ask your children, ask your parents, ask your family, ask your friends. Ask them these three questions. <clears throat> I, and I, by the way, I did this with my son maybe a year ago, and it scared me so much. Um, but the first question, right, with, with your significant other, an area that you want to, uh, a relationship that you want to help develop and help grow more, first question to ask them is, Hey, uh, so if I'm talking to Lise, hey, Lise, I love you. I want to try and love you better. What is, the first question is, what's something that I should keep doing? What have I been doing that you like that I should continue to do? Right? And whatever she says, okay, I'll keep doing those things. What should I stop doing? This is the tough question. What should I stop doing, right? Sometimes we tend to do things that we think are good. Um, my, <clears throat> my dad, every time we go out to eat, he will crack some sort of joke, like, without fail. And one of the things, if your dad just, the jokes, that they got to stop. It drives me nuts, right? Maybe, maybe as you ask that question, they'll say, Dad, you know, you never, you never spend as much time with me as I would like, or maybe your spouse would say something like, sweetheart, you, you, you bring the stress and the troubles of your work home to our house. 
Sweetheart, you work too much. Ask the question, what do you want me to stop doing? And then the last question. So the first question is, what, do you, what should I continue to do? The second question is, what should I stop doing? And then the third question is, what should I do? How can I love you in such a way that I'm not currently doing that now? Right? What is something that you wish that I would do that I am not uh, presently doing? And so as you ask these questions, you start to get uh, feedback and you start to see ways that you can intentionally love those closest to you. And again, I did this with my, my son William when he was, I think, four. He was, we were sitting around the dinner table and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. What is he going to say? Because um, <clears throat> I think I'm awesome, right? We all do. I don't need a change. Um, <clears throat> But it was really good. I wanted to, more than anything, communicate to my son, I love you, son, and I hear you, and I want to love you, and I want to be a good daddy to you. How can I do that? How can I do that? You might be thinking, well, what, if it, what if it doesn't work? What if I am, adopt all these things uh, to my kids? What if I turn my heart back to my kids, back to my family, back to my friends, and it's not reciprocated? And I would say that's, that's exactly what we have, that's exactly how we have treated Jesus. Right? We have turned from him. He has turned his heart towards us, and we turn our heart from him, but he still loves us, and he still died for us, and he did all that to bring us near. Let us show that same love, that same compassion to those around us. Christ calls us to turn our hearts back to our family. So these next couple of days, as you contemplate the new year, consider this. Consider how you could let those closest to you experience Christ living in you. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your word, Lord. Thank you for families. Thank you for people, Lord. Lord, I pray as we move these next couple of days into the new year, Lord. Let's, let's reorient our minds. Let's reorient uh, the way we are living. And let's, let's love our families well. Let's focus on our families well, Lord. Lord, as, as we remember who we were, where we came from, who we are, Lord, as we remember where we are going, as we know where we are going, Lord, I pray that our focus today is on those relationships to those closest to us, Lord. Lord, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.